Lovely. So there we go. So just a little bit about me to start with then. I'm Ali, as we've already discovered. I've worked for Different Travel, been with the company for oh, 16 months now. Um, I used to work as a fundraiser for a local hospice and then circumstances happened. I now work for the company, having known about them before, having been on your side as a fundraiser on a charity, charity trek. Um, so joined the company, what, 16 months ago, and I've been on two trips already, one of them being the Camino which I absolutely loved. I'm really hoping I'll inspire you to, to sign up as well. I absolutely, it's a fantastic trip. Um, we've got another one going out there this weekend. Another group has just come back. Um, we've got we've got quite a few happening next year as well. So um, hopefully you'll feel inspired. So let me start sharing my screen. I'll get the right one. There you go. Can you see that okay? Yes, we can. We can perfect. see all that. Yep, that's perfect. That's great. So that's one of the images, and that is the actual route there on the front screen there. So that's our first day. I'll take you through the whole thing anyway. Okay, so just uh, just get this bit out of the way first, a bit about our health and safety assurance. So we work quite closely with the British Foreign such a mouthful, British Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, so it's looking after the safety of all our travellers that go overseas. Um, just recently, you'll have heard about the the awful earthquake that we've had in in Morocco. Um, we are actually going back out there again. Our first trips go out there this week, and I'm on one on Saturday. Um, so yeah, so we work really closely. So if there was any thought that any of our travellers might be in danger, whether it's political reasons, we know stuff's going on over in Libya at the moment, um, anything like that, um, diseases, then we would either look to postpone or cancel the trip. Okay, it's not likely to happen, but you never you never know. But we just like to make make sure you're aware that you're completely covered if anything was to happen in that event. Okay, let's get on to the exciting bit now. So this is the Camino. So you'll be joining World Vision on an exclusive fundraising trek. And we say exclusive because obviously there's other groups that do do it, but if this one's exclusive to World Vision, it is only World Vision travellers that will be going on this particular trek. So you're taking on the eighth and final section of the French Way, which is the most traditional and best known of the Pilgrim's Ways. You'll get to explore the historic town of Santiago de Compostela. I can't tell you, it is absolutely stunning. I went there in, I said already, went there in April and we walked in and it was like blue skies. It was really warm. The cathedral itself, if you're into architecture, it's absolutely stunning. It's so beautiful. And best of all, when all, the, all your costs, your return flights, your meals and accommodation are all included. So there'll be no extras to pay. So Camino to San Diego, or the Way of St. James, it's a network of pilgrims' ways all leading to the great cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in Glacia, which is in northwestern Spain. And we're trekking the final section of the, of the French Way. The thousands of people known as pilgrims, they walk the Camino for a number of different reasons, whether it's spiritual, cultural or adventurous. It's not a religious tour. And the Camino is about the journey, and to the majority of people, it symbolises a time of reflection, learning, and fresh starts. Um, the group that I took out in uh, in April, they were from a, they were a hospice group, so they were walking for their own personal reasons. I walked it for my own reasons as well. I actually I lost my mum last year, so for me, it was a time of reflection for me. It was just. Um, it is life changing, and some people do say it is life changing when you go out there, and actually, it really is. Okay, so we'll just start touching on the itinerary. So you'll see on the top here, you can see my cursor moving about here. So we're walking, it's on the, along the yellow route here. Okay, we're not, so it starts on F1 there. We're not starting all the way over there, we're starting over here somewhere. Oh, it's F, this one, F8. So we're walking that sort of like bit there. It looks quite short there, but actually it's quite a big distance really, 100K. <laughs> it's, it's, not, a, it's not, not an easy trek. So day one, which is the 5th of October next year, so we'll fly from the UK to either Santiago, La Coruna, Vigo or Porto. But that really depends on when the flights are released. It depends what's flying out there at the time. 
So on arrival, we'll be picked up and you'll be driven to spend your first night at a hotel in Saria, where you'll have dinner and a briefing on the trek to come. So day two, so we'll see here, we're starting from the bottom down here, which is Saria, down the bottom here, and then up the top here to Porto Marin. Okay, so you'll have a really good breakfast at your accommodation. And you'll start your walk through shady, shady oak woods, pretty villages and quiet country roads. It's fair to say, actually, on the first day, it's a bit of a killer, actually. It's, um, I say that, it's, uh, you've got a, like a gradual incline going through the woods. Actually, the woods themselves are absolutely stunning. So it's that it's, it's a bit of a shock when you're going and think you're going to go for a nice, gentle walk along. And actually, you've got a, you've got a bit of an incline to go up with to start with. So um, it's, um, there's lots of, you'll get lots of inclines like that. And we'll go through the village of Barbadalio, which has a beautiful church. Um, actually, I'll need to move you over my move that, move you over there a bit. Okay, so it's the Church of Santiago, which features pictorials of fantastic birds, Daniel between two lions, and the three wise men before Herod. And the art displayed here represents the importance of resurrection and new beginnings. But when we do arrive in Porto Marin, there's a time to relax at the hotel and enjoy. The, well, there's lots of terraces on the main plaza. It's a beautiful town. It's quite it's quite a big town. And it's very open. There's a main square there. And there's lots of shops that are leading off it. And you'll get to learn about the history of the area as well. So on this day, it's quite a long walk. It's about 22 kilometres, which is around about six hours. Now, depending on the level of the group, you could be what you might walk slower than that. You might walk quicker than that. It's really up to you. This trek is quite different to our to our, our, our normal ones. We've got Saharas, we do Everest Base Camp, all sorts of different treks. But this one, you've got loads, you've got lots of different pilgrims walking along the route there, and you really can't get lost. So you could have what the, the front runner could be half an hour behind you, somebody might be half an hour behind you. It really doesn't matter. Everybody walks at their own pace. You don't have to stay together if you don't want to. You, there's lots of cafes along the route as well. So where one person stops, they might wait for you and then you'll get to start and have coffee with them and so on and so forth. It's it's really is your own, it's your own journey. So these times, or well, the distance is true, the times are really just guidelines. So that's your front cover picture. So that's the bit between Saria and Porto Marin, that's on the trek route there. The group that's came back a couple of weeks ago, that's one of the many cafes that they stopped in along the way. As Porto Marin sign itself. And see, they actually, that is from the, the day that they arrived there. You see, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful sunny day. You can get a bit of rain there as well. It's not all sunshine and glorious weather. You can get some, you get you can get some quite sharp showers as well. So just to be aware of that. So the terrain. So it will vary throughout the five days. But generally, you'll trek along country roads, compact dirt and stone footpaths, forest tracks, gravel trails, paved streets, and you'll go through woods and meadows. And there are some uphill and downhill paths. Um, they can, they're quite steady in climbs, but they can be quite steep up and downhill. Each day is going to be different. But it's important that your training includes hill walking and trekking up and down gradients. Jan, you'll know Cambridge is very flat. We don't have anywhere to train like that. <laughs> it's very flat here. <laughs> the, the local gym's a good one for that. And see, so there's a few pictures of the some of the route as well. One particular one that I actually got inspired me when I came back is the picture of the plants in boots down on the bottom left hand side here. So I've actually got a pair of old walking boots that I've planted up myself and they're growing some beautiful things out of them at the moment and not just weeds, I'm pleased to say. So yes, that's an idea of some of the terrain that you'll be walking through. Accommodation. Your accommodation will always depend. It's never really the same on each of our treks because it does depend on what's available at the time. But generally in larger towns, you'll stay in three-star hotels. In smaller towns, villages, the hotels and guest houses are usually of two-star standards. We say that sometimes they're better than that. We've had quite a good accommodation in uh, when I went in April. It was very good accommodation. The rooms are really spacious, really big bathrooms, but they're not all going to be like that. The accommodation is based on location, comfort, character and the service, and it'd be booked as most appropriate to the group and close to the historic town centres of town as we possibly can. 
Rooms are on a twin or triple shared basis. However, if you did want to, your own room, we can organise a single a single room, but there would be a single supplement to pay for that. And you can always ask us for details of that on booking. And it gives you an idea of some of the accommodation. So the Hotel Azua down on the bottom right hand side here. We, I stayed in that one in April and I think the group who came back, they also stayed in there. It's a really nice hotel room. That gives you an idea this on the bottom right here as well, the second one in, that gives you an idea of some of the size of some of the rooms at some of the, at some of the accommodation. But it is it's generally, it's really nice, very comfortable. So day three, you're going from Porto Marin to Palace de Rey. So again, we're starting at the bottom down here on the left-hand side, working our way up to the top here. So you can see it looks like it's quite a, quite a long way. So today, so today it's 25 kilometres. So again, another really long day. So when you leave the village of Porto Marin, it, you'll cross the River Minho, and you'll actually go over that as well on the way in. And you'll climb steadily uphill. So on your on, on your way, you'll cross Gonza and the Romanesque Church of Santa Maria Castro Maya. And then you'll stop for a moment to enjoy the peace and calm of the Galician Cemetery in Ligond. And you'll see several cemeteries along the way, actually. It's not just one. There are several along the route. So you'll continue on and uh, to Erex. I think that's how you say it. So I really apologise for my how I pronounce some of these some of these place names. And it's stunning church featuring a sculpture of Daniel, as well as Santiago de Peregrino. And your overnight stop will be in Palace de Rey, which is really small. It's a very small and pretty town as well. It's quite rainy when we went there, though, so I didn't really get to see much of it. There you go. Nice picturesque bit there. One of the many churches that you'll see along the route, you'll see lots of those along the route. There's many churches. Um, a lot of them you can stop in if you want to. Some of them will be closed up but the majority you're able to go in if you want to. And this day here, I think this might have been day three, which is a really long day. This year. You've got a lot of walking along a long road like this. It's probably a couple of hours in the morning when you're walking along a bit of road and then you'll get onto the more beautiful sections of the path. An idea of what your backpack should look like. Okay, so day four, so down on the bottom left-hand side, again, you've got your palace de Rey down here, moving up to Arzua, up on the, on the top here. So this is your longest day. You're walking about 29 kilometres, so it'll be about seven hours, but again, it depends on your pace. You could be quicker, you could be slower. It really doesn't matter. I so say you can't get lost on this route. There are so many signposts. We've probably got a picture on here somewhere of like the, the Camino shell, um, there's on lots of lots of lights on walls it's on bollards so you really can't get lost it's very difficult to get lost you'd have to really try if you wanted to get lost it's not easy so today we'll continue downhill and you'll pass the village of Casanova and the charming village of Leboreria at Malid there is a chance to stop in one of the many restaurants to try some local specialities Malid is a really big town. Um, the Jan, it's very actually similar, it's probably quite similar to Cambridge, actually, the size the size of Cambridge. Um, it's beautiful. Um, the guide who was with us last time, he said, I think he's pretty sure he said it's octopus is their speciality. And he did encourage some of the group to try it. So if you are a fish person, you'd like to try some octopus, then please do. So it's either octopus or squid. Pretty sure it's octopus. But yeah, it's apparently it's one of the specialities of that of that town anyway. It's a big town, many shops there. Um, you've got chemists, you know, the supermarkets, there's a little, little little corner shops, little one-stop shops, um, some delicatessens, there's a few cafes as well. So it's quite it's a nice to stop there for, for a while and have a bit of a browse around too, and you're still on you're still on the trek. And uh, yeah, you it's easy to pick up the route from there. So later today, the Camino will follow, follow a forest track and crosses several streams, bringing us to the village of Buente with its church of Santiago. It is a beautiful walk. The forest is absolutely stunning. I mean, I've not been through it in October, but in April, it was absolutely, it was just, everything was just so green. It was lush, it was, it was, it was quite wet. We had, we had a lot of rain earlier, earlier in the week, but it was just very green. It's just quite nice to just, 
stop and sort of focus on what was around you, listen to the birds singing and just spend a bit of time reflecting. So it really is a pretty, is a pretty part of the route. So you pass through the medieval village of Ribadizo and you'll finally reach Azura, which is where you'll stay overnight. Again, it's it's a smaller, it's a smaller Cambridge. Um, it's a small town, has two churches that can be visited, um, Santa Maria and La Magdalena. And it has a population of around 7,000 and is famous for its creamy cheese and kiexo. Um, we, when I got there, it was quite late, so we didn't really have much chance to walk around, but walking in, it is absolutely stunning. As I said, you'll be walking about 29 kilometres, which is around about seven hours of walking. Um, and you'll want to stop as well. Along, along the route, there are so many cafes and places that you can stop. So you can stop for coffee and just get toilet break stop for cake anything really but there are many places that you can stop along the route so you'll never sort like more than five kilometers without being able to stop somewhere so your meals so your meals are included as per the itinerary and there'll be delicious spanish meals that will keep your energy levels high for each day's walk we value foods quite a lot on our treks because we, you're, you're putting your body through so much with each day's trekking. We always make sure that the food is really good. It's, it's great to keep your energy levels up. And there's usually plenty of it too. Breakfast and evening meals will be taken in a communal dining room at the accommodation or at local restaurants. It depends on the accommodation that you're going to be staying in. You'll eat packed lunches, which you'll carry yourself each day, or you can stop in small local restaurants but your packed lunches will be provided and they're provided by each accommodation each morning for you. So you just need to make sure that you'll pick it up and your guides and your tour manager will assist you with that. So your typical meals will include for breakfast, it'll be bread, cheese. It's your continental style breakfast. Lunch will be packed lunches with bread, cheese, fruit, cured meats, oat bars, um, usually a bottle of water as well. You'll have supplied with that. And then dinner is usually a three course set menu with soup, salads, fish, meat and vegetables. And at some of the restaurants or hotels you stay in, you'll, leave, you'll, you'll get a bottle of wine as well. Not each, but <laughs> there's usually one or two bottles of wine on the table for you to enjoy as well. You are welcome to bring your own snacks. And we do suggest that you do because we all like our own comforts. We all like, we all know what we're used to. However, since we, we're no longer in the EU, EU, so foods containing meat, dairy, fresh fruit and veg, including cartons of fruit juice, are no longer allowed to be bought into Spain. So you do have to be really careful about what you do take. Tap water on this, tra on this trip is safe to drink and bottles can be refi refilled at, at your accommodation and at water fountains along the route. And as I said, there's so many cuffs along the way as well. There's ample opportunity to fill up during the day. You'll need to carry a bottle to carry your own drinking water. And during a trek, you'll need to drink at least three litres of water per day to keep yourself hydrated, especially if it is warmer weather, you find you're perspiring more. So you have to make sure you keep your water levels topped up. We can cater to most dietary requirements if we are told in advance and we do reiterate, we have to be told in advance if you do have any dietary issues, like gluten, if you're gluten free, lactose intolerant, anything like that, please make sure that we know in advance. And you can do that by telling us on your booking form. And we will send you regular reminders as well. An example of some of the food there. But paella is it's one of the dishes we ate at one of the, uh, we went to a restaurant in when we stayed in Azua. So that was one of the, one of the dishes there. Obviously, you've got your, uh, your shells there, your shellfish, your rolls too. Bathroom facilities, always a talking point on our treks. So during a trek, you will have to, you will have daily access to showers and toilets at your guest houses and accommodation. So you really no worries there at all. It's not like you're camping where you don't have that, you don't have that luxury. So you will have access to showers at your accommodation. Most rooms will have a private bathroom, but there may occasionally be the opportunity where you do have to have share a bathroom. Towels will be provided. Toilets is not always so, so do make sure you bring your own. You may also wish to carry a small pack of baby wipes for your own hygiene during a trek, such as cleaning your hands before you eat lunch. If you need to use the toilet during a trek day and you're not near, a, near somewhere where you can stop, you should find a private area off the trail and just clean up after yourself then. So we do advise taking a toilet roll and nappy bags as well so you can pop your bits into. 
meant to be disposed of in a bin when you reach your nearest bin. One to one roll of toilet paper will suffice for this. I'll say it's 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 highly unlikely that you would need to stop in between calves because there are so many along the routes. I think the first day is a first day. I think it's about six or seven kilometers before you reach your first calf, but and there are but there are plenty of places to go off should you need to. And as I've already said, there are many bars and calves along the route, so there's not many sections where you won't have those facilities. However, having said that, a lot of the bars and calves will only allow you to use the toilet if you purchase a coffee or something from them. Usually not a problem. OK, so day five, our Zua Taru Apina. So again, starting down the bottom here and working on our way to the top up here. So it's a shorter day today, especially in comparison to yesterday. So it's 18 kilometers. So it's about five and a half hours. So you you might relish it's the shortest dis distance on this day because you're probably going to be start feeling quite tired by this point. Um, so today you'll pass through woods, along streams and through sleepy villages. Again, it's another beautiful part of the walk. You'll take your time and visit the, cha the Chapel of Santa Arena with its unique statues of Santiago. That's really easy to be missed. You actually have to go when you're walking along, you've got a bridge and you have to sort of look out for the signpost because you, you go under that bridge and you just to, to the left there. So it is really it's really easy to miss, especially if you're walking on your own and you're not quite sure. The rest of the way to Rua Apina is on, is on a good and quiet country road. And it is very quiet and it's one of the less crowded stopping points before Santiago to Compostela. Again, it is it is. A, a, it is one of the most beautiful route, parts of the route. And then this is your, your climax day. So we're up here to Santiago to Compostela. So again, starting from the bottom and working our way up to the top here. So today is the day. So you'll head to Lavacolla, where pilgrims traditionally washed in a river before reaching Santiago. And there are tall eucalyptus trees that will line the way to Monte del, Go uh, Monte del Gozo, which is actually is the Mount of Joy. It's absolutely stunning on there. So it is, it is a mount. Um, the group that I took up there in April, so we, we gathered around there and um, I said the Pilgrim's Prayer and we sang, a, we sang a hymn and had a few minutes of reflection as well. It's actually very emotional because you know what you're about to do. You're about to head down and walk into Santiago. And it's it's quite a moment to reflect and all, you see it all around you as well, especially if you've got a really clear day, which we did have. Is this it's it is absolutely stunning. Um, when I get up to so you'll descend into the city, which seems like it's an absolute lifetime because you've got the Mount of Joy, you get your first peak of the cathedral when you're looking down into Santiago and you get to see the cathedral for the first time. And it just feels like you're walking forever because you know you're near the end point, but it's just one of those which seems to get further and further away the nearer, nearer, nearer you get. But the the minute you turn the corner and you see the cathedral, it's like, wow, when you've done this, it's a very emotional and you'll gather together, you'll probably hug each other. And But there are so many other pilgrims in the square as well. They're all doing exactly the same thing and they're all gathering together and having a photos taken in front of the cathedral. So you'll do that. You'll, sp you'll spend a bit of time there and then you'll go and check into your hotel and you can relax after completing your Camino. That's a long, it is a longer day, it's 21 kilometres, but again, it's about five and a half hours. Um, could be shorter, could be longer, again, as with the rest of the days. This is my group that I took in April, so we all gathered there together, so we're all with hospice. The chap on the left here, you can see my cursor, so that's, that was, uh, um, that's Ivan, he was one of our guides. And then a guide here in the green shirt, if you can see my cursor circling from here, that's Fran. He was also, we had two guides on this trip because there were quite a few travellers with us. So um, absolutely amazing. Um, they, they'll really help you. They'll let you know where your end point's going to be and they'll be there waiting for you. And yeah, they're, they're, they're really, the, the guides are absolutely amazing. Picture of the cathedral there. See that was uh, that yeah it was one of the pictures I took so you can see the blue skies that we had it was a, it was about twenty seven degrees on that day it was really it was really warm and then inside the cathedral as well so that's the uh, crypt for um, Saint James and then on the right hand side here that's in the um, in the cathedral as well like the, the architecture side it's absolutely stunning 
and hopefully this will work. So yeah, so you can see here, so this is the incense and we were really fortunate when we went. So Thursday is Pilgrim's Mass Day in the evenings. It starts at, I think it's 7.30, I think it started. And you like gather in there. But the burner, groups have to pay, I think it's about 300 euros, I think somebody said. So there was actually a Japanese group that actually paid to have the incense burner uh, being going up and down can't think of the words I'm looking for but you're surprising actually it goes up so high you, you wonder how it doesn't actually hit the ceiling because it really does go the way that it's going it's the, the guy on the left hand side pulling on the rope to make you swing that's the words I'm looking for so it's, it swings up and down so absolutely it's amazing and it smells beautiful as well however the one thing with the pilgrim's mass on a Thursday is in Spanish so I have no idea what they were saying got an idea of a few bits um but the, the um, is it Friday or the Saturday? I think it's Friday. They have they have like a, a twelve o'clock mass for uh, the English version. So, um, but yeah, it was in Spanish, but it was well worth it to see the incense burner being swung in the cathedral. Stunning. There we go. So that's your certificate, which is on the left hand side. There, I've got mine up on the wall here. Another group that went last year. So then on the Friday, it's your day to enjoy at your leisure. So you'll get a whole day to spend in, in Santiago. So there's there's plenty of opportunities. There's, there's an excursion. I can't think where it was to now, but I'd love to let you know. But you can take a bus tour to somewhere else outside the city. Um, let's say there's optional excursions there, which are available for supplement, but you pay that locally. If you did want to, I would recommend doing the the the, um, the tour of the roof of the cathedral. It's absolutely beautiful there, and you get to see in, inside the the windows of the cathedral. You get some really good photos actually. If you get your get your camera right up close to the glass, you can get some really good photos of the statues that are in there. And then tonight, you'll gather for a celebratory farewell dinner before your return flight on the Saturday. So the celebratory dinner, we all gather together and it's a chance to celebrate everything that you've done, the trek, what you've reflected on, share your stories, because you're bound to have stories um, that, you've, that you've accrued along the way. It's not just our group that you'll see, but you'll see other pilgrims along the way. And you might stop and chat with some of those and walk with some of those along your route too. Okay, so some frequently asked questions. So communication. So Wi-Fi or internet access is available at some hotels and guest houses, but not all of them, but the majority of them there are, though. Um, the Camino does go through rural areas where service may not be as reliable. But having said that, when we were on the trek, I think we all had some pretty good service along the way, actually. And the good thing about being in Spain, if you've got your data, has got data roaming on your phone, you can easily use your, use your allowance through there without any problems. Yeah, say during a check, most mobile phones should have reception. But again, that is subject to your provider, though, so it's worth checking with them in advance. It may be intermittent in the village, in the valleys and more rural spots. So we didn't generally have a problem when we were over there. Travel insurance, you should arrange this yourself and we can send you a link to, to our provider. It's no good to be showing you that on there, really, because you can't click it. So, But there's Campbell Irvine, it's the insurance company that we use. And we use them for many of our treks and they're used to our travellers. Footwear trainers are not suitable. However, you don't need to wear expensive trekking boots. The trekking shoes, I haven't got, of course I have, bear with me. I wore trekking shoes on this trip, similar to something like, oh, can you, oh, this camera like that, so you don't need the high ankle ones. So like trekking shoes like this, I'll wear Merrells because they're purely because they're, they're good for my feet and that's what I'm used to, but it's worth, um, so you don't need to buy expensive trekking boots. So it's just, there's no point, you don't you don't need that support. Uh, when, it's, when we're trekking the Sahara, we do need that because the dunes and everything else that we're walking along. But for this, but trainers are not suitable. So please no trainers, but trekking shoes like that will be absolutely fine for you. Age limit, so the minimum age is 18 or 16 to 17 if accompanied by a parent or guardian, and there is no upper age limit. One of the ladies I walked with, she turned, she turned 78 when we were out there. Absolutely amazing woman. Many stories we shared together. 
got a medical problem, can you take part? See your GP for consultation first before you commit to anything. There's usually no reason why you can't sign up for, for this particular trek. But if, you're, if you are worried, you think you might have a, a condition that might give cause for concern, please talk to your doctor first. We do say that all medical, medical conditions must be declared and if necessary, a medical form signed by your GP. Bear with me. So the picture on the left hand side here is like one of the many signs that you'll see along the along the way and you'll see arrows like this on walls as well especially if you're going through villages you'll see a little yellow arrow pointing you in the right direction so it's really difficult to get lost so how challenging is it so this trek is graded as moderate to challenging for someone of a good level of fitness and there's a number of factors which make this trip challenging you are carrying <coughs> excuse me your own day pack and it is just your day pack. All your other luggage will be travel will be transferred between accommodation for you. So it's literally just what you need for that day. You might want to take a fleece with you, potentially rain covers as well, because it's likely you may well get rain. Um, your own, you might want your own snacks, a small first aid kit you'll need to carry with you as well, and plus you're carrying your own water too as well. So um, so other, and other bits and pieces you, you might want to have with you. So you are carrying your own day pack, which could wreck what could be around six to eight kilometers, uh, kilograms in weight. Are trekking long distances over different terrain, which will include some uphill sections, but so, sometimes the uphill is not, it's not the worst, but it's actually the coming down can be hard, especially if you've got weak knees as well. Um, so downhill can be a bit more problematic. I walk with a trekking poles whenever I'm doing any of these things, much easier for my knees, especially going downhill. Walking for many hours a day, sometimes seven to eight hours might be a bit longer, especially on that long day when you're doing 29 kilometers, so you could be a bit longer. Staying in basic hotels and guest houses, I say that loosely because they're not all they're not all basic because some's quite luxurious on some of them, so. But please don't underestimate the importance of your training. The more training you do beforehand, the more familiar your body will be in recovery, especially when you're having trekking long days. And so it's really important you start each day rested and prepared. And it's your responsibility for coming to Spain as fit as you can be. How should you train? Well, that's quite easy. Really, get outside and start walking. That's what you're going to be doing. These steps here, actually, on the right hand side. They are, I can't remember, I, I did count them and I've forgotten now. It's either 54 or there's 74 steps altogether. There's this one here and there's, as you walk along, there's, there's some more steps here. That's your first day. So when you've um, left Saria to Porta Marin, you're, you're actually faced with these. And when you're feeling a bit tired, it can be quite hard, but it's, um, but they're, they're fun to do. They are fun, really. Not sadistic at all. <laughs> If you're not a regular walker, start slowly with short distances and then as you get more comfortable, increase your mileage and add in different terrain. Um, as an example, I use my Sundays as my long training days. Um, I'd start initially, I'll start at two hours and I'll increase it by half hour each Sunday. So I'm building up to a nice long stretch well, at least once a week and try to do back to back long walks the closer I get to, to a challenge. Ideally, a Saturday or Sunday, if you've got holidays, and if you can fit into a couple of days back to back long walking days, it's ideal, really. Just helps your body to prepare. Hill walking, if you can, with a backpack, it should feature highly in your training, more to prepare your body. Other activities that can complement uh, is, uh, is running, cycling, if you're a runner, that'd be great. Cycling, gym workouts, boot camps. Build up your core and leg muscles, really important to build those up. Um, so strength is important. So squats, lunges, push-ups, planks, crunches, they will really enhance your training. And the best thing about that is they can be done at home. You don't have to, you don't have to join a gym to do that sort of thing. But please take your training seriously as and arrive as fit as you can be for the trek. So who is right for the challenge? Absolutely anybody. I'm not going to go into all this. Absolutely anybody can do this trek. Um, it could be a dad with grown up children, a successful businesswoman, someone starting a new career. Absolutely anybody can do this trick and anybody any, and anybody will do. So how much does it cost? So there's a registration fee of £375 payable at the time of booking. That will seem like a lot of money, and it and it and it is a lot. It's a big lump sum 
to start with, but we can take installments for that. So if you if you do think that is a bit much, contact us and we can arrange an installment plan for you. It's not a problem at all. £375 in this day and age, it's, it's a big chunk to come out of like a month out of, out of your monthly salary. So uh, please do contact us if you'd like to break that down a bit. And then you have a choice of payment options. So sponsorship. So you'll be asked to raise a, a minimum of £3,100 for World Vision. A minimum of 2,500 must be paid to the charity by the 12th of July, 2024. The remaining 600 must be fundraised by the date of departure. There is also a flexible option. So you'll pay 1,550 pound trip costs and fundraise a minimum of 1,550 for World Vision. A minimum of 1,250 must be paid by the 12th of July and the remaining 300 are fundraised by the date of departure. It's just to note, say, because we've got an asterisk there, trip costs are based on the final group size and are subject to change. The more people that sign up to the trip, the cheaper, the slightly cheaper it would be for you. So your trip will include return flights from the UK, all transfers and transport in Spain, all your accommodation, your meals, as per the itinerary, excluding lunch on day seven, English speaking guides, Luggage transfers during the trek, as I said, all your luggage will be transferred between accommodation. So there's a minibus that will pick that all up for you. And then a different Travel UK tour manager, so somebody like me, we're expedition first aid trained as well. So if there were any issues, we'll be able to help you. It does not include any visa or travel permit, depending on EU regulations at the time of departure. If you're a UK national, there, there, there is you don't need anything. Personal expenses, so there's many cuffs along the route, so if you wanted to buy a coffee, you'll probably want to take a little bit more money with you. Any necessary vaccinations, talk to your own travel clinic about that. Your travel insurance. Tips, which we say to allow around 30 to 35 pound per person, and the guides are amazing, so you'll want to tip them. And then your own trek kit and equipment that you'll, that you'll, you'll need for, the, for, the, for this particular trip. So what support will you get? So the World Vision team, they'll support you through the challenge with your fundraising. You'll be provided with a kit list, trip dossier, training guide, discount vouchers, and more, accompanied by a first aid trained different travel tour manager and professional local guides, and a pre-departure meeting. So similar to something like this with your teammates and different travel. It could be me, it could be somebody else. And I think Jan's gonna take you through this slide. Fabulous. Yes. Uh, thanks, Ali. I'm sitting here getting very excited yeah. about the uh, idea of this track. It sounds uh, sounds amazing. And also mm -hmm. just the, the ability to do it with other people um, makes it feel very special. I think there's something about it being a pilgrimage and doing it together feels like um, something very special. I know it's a bucket list thing for quite a few people, but it, the, the combination of, of doing it together is great. Um, so, uh, Ali's mentioned uh, the cost, so I won't go through that. But but one of the uh, one of the, the the ass is the fundraising, and that is a big part of the challenge. Um, you know, the, the, there's a challenge doing the walking, but the other big part of the challenge is the fundraising. And um, it may be that you're not comfortable in 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 raising the whole amount. And as Ali has mentioned, um, absolutely fine to um, pay the way, which is half of that, and then to fundraise for half of it, or yeah, to to fundraise for the whole amount, or indeed to 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 fund it all yourself. Uh, any of those options are possible. On this slide are just a few ideas, and the I I, I won't specifically go through them but the idea that you if you book early then you've got um, almost a whole year to be able to break it down is a, a top tip really from us from the fundraising team here at world vision and breaking it down by um, maybe doing an event or um, or, or um, setting up a just giving page or um, selling some things increasingly, you know, um, eBay and different places like that. People are are selling stuff to to raise money instead of necessarily holding um, holding lots of events. 
between now and then, if my thinking is right, because we have got a whole year, everybody will have a birthday, which is often a really good opportunity. And some of us might have a big birthday. Uh, it's often a really good opportunity to raise some money as well. And, and obviously there's Christmas too. So I know it sounds like a big amount, um, but as I say, if you break it up like this, then um, it, it, it makes it very much easier. Uh, from us, from World Vision, you, you will get sent a fundraising pack, which has lots more ideas and tells you step by step how to set up a Just Giving page. Um, we will also send you a, a, a World Vision sports um, technical T-shirt um, that uh, you'll be able to wear, not every day because that would be smelly, but on some days um, during the trek and you can also use it for, for your fundraising. And Sandra Nwoke is our fundraising officer and she will very much be on hand to support you in the fundraising um, journey that you will be part of. Um, and I just wanted to assure you that the money um, very much would be going um, to support the work that World Vision does. Um, and that is across the world, working in um, some of the most difficult parts of the world. We're a charity, uh, a children's charity specifically, that is trying to create a, a longer lasting difference to the lives of children into the future. And we work in over a hundred countries um, and very much working with and alongside local communities to make a difference to the lives of, um, as I say, children who are living in quite difficult circumstances. Um, but I can, we will give you more information about that as you sign up. Um, talking of sign up, I think I'll pass back to you, Ali, and then we've got some time for questions at the end. Lovely. Thanks so much, Jan. OK, so moving on. So signing up. So um, it's the link at the top there. Um, you just go onto the Different Travel website. You'll be able to find that on there in our, in our trips bit. And I think, Jan, I don't know if you've got it on your own website as well anyway. So if you go through the World Vision website, then you'll be able to find it on there too. And then just click on the book now. I hope you've got a little pop-up here. There you go. Your book now on the right-hand side there. So just click on there. You'll have a nice long form to fill in. It'll ask you for all sorts of information. Initially, all we need at the start will be your name and your name address details, your passport, and your travel insurance. It can wait a little bit, but don't delay too long for putting those in. Um, the flights are usually released about 11 months before a trip. So it'll be about November, December time. So as long as we've got your passport details in the next couple of months, because then we use them to, for booking your flights. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> travel insurance, next to kin, all those sort, that sort of thing can wait a little bit. So if you're quite keen to book up and don't have all the information to hand to start with, it really doesn't matter. As long as we've got your name, address, contact details, that's pretty much all we need to start with. Okay. And then, um, so World Vision, this Camino is not the only trek that um, World Vision are putting on. They've got Jurassic Coast, and there's an information evening coming up on that one soon. And then Zambia Canoe, we had the information on that last week. Jan, did you want to talk about any of those? Um, no, just to say, yep, yeah, we've got an information evening just like this one um, on Thursday for the Jurassic Coast. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to all of them. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Jan. And that's that. Any questions? Let me stop sharing my screen. I'm going to be able to see you all properly then. There we go. Probably stop recording now, I think, Ali. Yeah, as well. that's fine. <laughs> Everybody can feel free to ask any embarrassing questions.